here at the AA, we can't quite decide whether it was three years ago or four years ago. Fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> he says it feels like it was a long time ago. Uh, and uh, we're now going to get this, this, uh, his last, this last session going. And uh, let me introduce you to Alistair. Alistair Brown. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, I've never taken part in a conference like this with formal respondents and uh, opportunities to uh, discuss afterwards. And when you're the last speaker, and when you have been lured into the discussion several times from the floor, you feel that perhaps your audience has heard quite sufficient of your voice before you give your paper. So I'm sorry, if you ever ask me back, I'll stay mum in the body of the Kirk. Uh, now, what I'd like to talk about um, in my 40 minutes is, in a sense one might say, the two approaches which Adam takes to architecture in his later years. And I also want to preface it with a look at Robert Adam as an artist, a person producing drawings which are pictures as opposed to drawings in the sense that Giles was so carefully and so excellently describing. And I thought I'd begin by two landscape views the very famous view from the Temple of the Four Will Winds at Castle Howard, looking across to Vanvera's Bridge, the artificial lake, and then the great Hawksmoor and Daniel Garrett monument on the hill. Nature to advantage dressed with classical buildings in an improved landscape. And on the far screen, you have the view from Robert Adams' father's house, Blair Adam, near Kinross, which he bought as the result of his success as a builder and architect in Scotland, uh, developed, planted. And this is what Robert would have seen when he went uh, to what the family always simply called the Blair, and that is Benarty Hill, immediately outside uh, the policies of Blair Adam itself. Now, clearly there are two different types of landscape here. And what is interesting is that in the 18th century, there is a well-developed theory that the style of architecture must be appropriate to the setting in which the building is going to be placed. This is an idea that is developed by um, Roger Morris in his theoretical treatises on architecture and discussed by the poet William Shenston, amongst others. And it's obviously an idea which Robert Adam responded to. Now, we've talked already about uh, what he found when he went to Italy and took Clarisseau into his um, team of people to advise him. And it, within the classical landscape tradition, I think it's interesting to refer to the 40 drawings which are now in the Morgan Library in New York, uh, a beautiful volume on white and some of them pale blue sheets. And I think we know something about this volume because in a letter of 1756, uh, Robert had written to uh, John in response to a letter from John, his eldest brother, saying that he had been thinking of publishing some views in the taste of gardens. And Bob, who was already beginning to feel that his brother was a bit old-fashioned, was a little bit anxious about this, and he wrote to say that he would greatly like, since he'd been in Rome, to have an opportunity to advise his elder brother on the landscape at Blair dictating, if you'll excuse the phrase, some Italian beauty which the length of my picturesque genius could suggest, or the continuance of my sojourn in this country entitle me to propose to you. He thought, I don't think it's an awfully good idea for Johnny to publish a book of ideas because he wasn't exactly au courant. He hadn't had the benefit of being in Rome. But Johnny's idea of publishing a set of uh, landscape views had started Robert off in doing drawings himself. And I think the Morgan Library volume actually contains the volumes, the drawings which are referred to in this letter. Uh, <coughs> this is in November 1756. 
I have already made out a dozen of different views, as unlike one and other as I could, which I hope will prove of use to me, as it will show that I can carry that affair a greater length than Kent, Margaret Richardson, please note, a greater length than Kent or his disciples have yet brought it, as I have a greater ease in drawing and disposing of trees and buildings and ruins picturesquely, which Kent was not quite the master of, as all his trees are perpendicular. We know that, don't we? All <laughs> His trees are perpendicular and stiff, and his ruins are good for nothing. Now, it's, it's, this is typical, Adam, the sort of thing in which he, it's a private letter going home to the family does him disservice as a man, because it certainly wasn't meant to be read out by anybody at a conference 200 years after his death. And I think we must remember that. But this interest in landscape improvement putting ruins, little classical buildings within a landscape, as we see in the Morgan Library drawings, informs a great deal of his work after he gets back to this country. On the far screen, I'm afraid it's a slightly murky slide, it's something the AA really has a marvellous jinx on pretty slides. It manages to make them look much dimmer than they are when you project them anywhere else. I think it's something to do with the way the light bleeds in. But anyway, this is a view of the little fishing temple and then looking across to Kettleston and the woodlands beyond it, in which I would like to suggest to you what uh, Adam is actually doing is trying to create in reality that sort of ideal that he has has already uh, achieved in the Morgan uh, Library drawings. And here in the engraved view from the published works, of course, you've got a wonderful Roman ruin, uh, a, a viaduct with a wonderful supporting arcading and rusticated masonry, and this was proposed as a bridge for Lord Shelburne at Bowood, though it was never, in fact, carried out. So there are picturesque drawings produced by Robert Adam which are designs for buildings which will look like classical ruins within a classical, even, regular landscape. Water, banks of trees, no great irregularity. The capability Brown vision, if you like. From not long after he established himself here in January 1758 in London, uh, Adam's sisters came down to look after him. And by 1760, a regular trip in July and August was to Margate and Kent. He went with his sisters and they had a holiday. And there's a charming letter from James who is, um, got himself right down as far as Naples and is feeling really rather lonely and wishing he was back home in which he says, I, it has occurred to me a pretty fantasy that I could take a boat and sail away from Italy and arrive and picnic with all of you at Margate. Now, <laughs> <laughs> sets the whole concept of the Grand Tour in a new light, doesn't it? <laughs> but when Bob travelled, he made these views. And we've had reference to the military draftsman Thomas and Paul Sandby. He was, of course, a close friend of Paul Sandby who helped him with his engravings. And these are two views, St. Augustine's Abbey Gateway on the far screen, and beside me here, um, a view at Sandwich, at the quaysides at Sandwich near Margate. And these are record drawings, tinted outlines, clear topographical drawings. They are not picturesque drawings, they are simply Adam recording in perhaps the way he had learned from Clariso how to record uh, Roman remains, now recording vernacular and Gothic buildings in Britain. He here appears as a topographical draftsman. But there is another side to Robert Adam's personality, and I would like to put it to you as a very important side. He is the most artistic of all the British architects of the 18th century. He thought he composed ruins and drew trees better than William Kent, and I am inclined to agree with his own estimate of his abilities. Now, there are over a thousand picturesque drawings by Robert Atom of an invented, free, and at times rather theatrical landscape. And I think, though they are, in a sense, just mood mechanisms like so much 18th century landscape painting, nevertheless they achieve quite a range within an accepted genre. And to demonstrate that for you here, I put up on the near screen a view of nymphs bathing with waterfall and a great crag of, covered with trees and then a view through to a mountain top 
nicely framed, neat, elegant composition, very much in the tradition of Richard Wilson and going back through Wilson to perhaps Claude's Liber Veritatis, and it has certainly got the same silvery light as many of the Liber Veritatis drawings. On the far screen, we've got something that's a little bit more moody, a little bit more evocative. It always reminds me of this, of some of Gainsborough's landscape paintings, peasants going to market, peasants returning from market, in which you have got woodland, uh, really rather shrubby trees, a high view looking down to a little river down below, and it's <coughs> got a much more closely focused view of really a coppice rather than the carefully studied ideal landscape of the silvery drawing. Two more. Uh, the previous two were from the National Gallery of Scotland. Uh, on the far screen here, we have an evocative moonlit scene of a castle with the moon appearing behind clouds. It is interesting, I absolutely agree with Margaret, Adam never chose to show any of his buildings with clouds and trees and moonlight uh, at all, but he does a great many paintings like this. This is from the family collection at Blair Adam, and here on the screen beside me, you've got another one from the National Gallery uh, in Scotland, uh, very, very quick evocative sketch, the uh, body colour just blobbed in, a few quick uh, sepia hair lines here looping round the moon, and it seems to me that this has much of the freedom that we associate with an artist like Alexander Cousins and his blot landscapes. Bob catching up very, very quickly the sense of place, a moonlit uh, seashore, or perhaps a little bit like the Reverend William Gilpin uh, in the Moonlit Castle uh, from the family collection at Blair Adam. So there is a range within these picturesque drawings. Alan Tate has suggested that the picturesque drawings were produced when the going got rough for Adam when life was very difficult, when financial affairs of his company were hard, when the recession was really biting, and that in a sense it represented an escape for him uh, to, in an evening, devise these picturesque drawings. Um, we have the testimony of his sister, who wrote a fairly extensive and published life of her brother after his death, that these drawings were produced because when the going got tough, Adam became worried about what would happen to his sisters. And he wanted to provide them with a patrimony. And he produced these drawings, a thousand of them, so that the sisters, he gave them to the sisters, they would be their property. And quite clearly, he's producing them consciously as an artist, as a person who had trained abroad how to draw, and who, as the four that I've already shown you, I think, sufficiently represent, was very much au courant in terms of picturesque drawing and picturesque presentation at that time. There is, however, one genre of these watercolour drawings which Adam made peculiarly his own, and it is the rather melodramatic scenery which you see on the screen at the moment. Great cataracts tumbling down through rocky canyons with ruined castles and lofty mountain peaks behind them. And a great many of the drawings which he did for the sisters are of this character, with a, a rather elaborate use of chiaroscuro and dark uh, foregrounds. And if you look carefully, they're often inhabited by tiny little primitive Scottish people of some ancient race, <laughs> which you see here, or walking across the bridge up at the top. Now, these are Robert Adams' pictures picturesque drawings. And what I think is interesting is there is a whole side to him. It's been a fascinating conference today because we've looked at him as a furniture designer, as a young man traveling and being influenced by Piranesi. We've looked at him uh, as, a, as a developer. We've looked at him as a man running an office and how does he treat, uh, how does he manage his office drawings. Uh, but aside from all that, there is quite definitely a very considerable artist in the form in which most of my students in the Edinburgh College of Art are training to be artists. And I think that's something worth emphasizing. Here are two more examples. Uh, a marvelously dramatic view, something like Philip de Luthenberg's scenery, uh, perhaps, which was such a, an important influence in uh, English taste in the 1770s with a castle caught in the light of the setting sun, and here a slightly more pastoral view, mountains in the background, and a castle once again. 
Uh, and the interesting thing here is that you are now looking at the imaginative creative Adam as a pictorial artist and Adam as a recorder. Because the view which I have left up is in fact a real castle. A castle designed by Robert Adam and extended from an L-shaped tower house into the battlemented house that you see on the screen here. Now this is Oxenford. It's a late work. I take late works to mean anything after the Adelphi crisis of 1773 when the finances of the family and of Britain on the whole uh, with the impending war with the American colony colonies was restricting opportunity and leading into recession. Oxenford Castle was developed by uh, Robert from 1782 onwards. It was uh, his patron here. Uh, Sir Hugh Dalrymple was an amateur writer on aesthetics. He wrote a book on the decoration of landscape, which he sent down to uh, William Shenstone. And in that, he talks about the appropriateness of the style of a building to its setting. And he wrote to an antiquarian friend here in London, I wish you would come and visit us sometime in Scotland, where I have lately restored an old castle, and with the help of Bob Adams, have made it look much older than it really is. <laughs> now, <coughs> the reason why uh, Dalrymple decided to make his house in the castle style is for this aesthetic notion that an upland setting with hills and a great ravine below the house make the style appropriate, battlemented, ancient, baronial, stirring the imagination with a sensation or a memory of the ancient national past, that is what is appropriate to a moorland or an upland setting. And we can, on occasion, match Adam the artist with Adam the architect. And I suppose the most dramatic moment in which you can do that is on the screen at the moment. You're looking here at Culain Castle, the largest and most complex of all the castles which he succeeded in building. And on the far screen, uh, the artist's view of that house. And this really does seem to me to sort of presage the developments of Turner and, and Ruskin when they went down the Rhine Valley in which they sort of greatly augmented the natural lie of the landscape and you can see how Adam in his drawing makes Culain sit like a fortified palace on top of a great rock whereas though it is above a cliff it's not in quite such a dramatic setting as it appears here. So there must be perhaps some interface between Adam the romantic picturesque artist and Adam the architect. <coughs> Here, I think we see it again in proposals on the far screen for uh, a ruined castle at Osterley. Uh, Robert Child was comparatively nouveau riche, uh, very wealthy, uh, a banker, building an opulent series of rooms. And Adam's last proposal, and this bears, I think, on a point which I was making earlier today about the importance of, of patronage. Adam's last proposal was that it might be nice to build a ruined Norman castle in the grounds and wave your hand and suggest that that's where the childs had originated. And so you have this ancient uh, view of a castle to be put within the park. Here, you have a castle, Dunstall Castle, on the edge of the park at Croom Court, which was uh, Lord Coventry's estate, and Adam charged ten guineas for designing that ruin and an extra three guineas for making an alteration to the design of the ruin to suit Lord Coventry's taste. And it's, it's one of the very few documented sham castles by Robert Adam, and interestingly is neo-Roman rather than neo-Gothic in its formal terms. But here are two picturesque buildings which seem to me to relate to the picturesque aesthetic of these great cataracts and ruined pieces. Uh, Ian Guy has referred to the ruined viaduct that was to connect across the ravine to Culain Castle. There on the far screen you see the design drawing for it, a sort of extraordinary asymmetrical straggle of arches and little buildings. Notice halfway along there was to be a sort of porter's bothy with uh, what in the other drawings appears to be red pan-tiled roof of a distinctly Italianate or Diocletian palace 
connotation. And then just, this is a view looking back across the ravine to the square and round tower, which are at that end of the design. Now, this design for the ruined viaduct at Culane um, <coughs> dates from uh, 1789, so it's within three years of, of Robert Adams' death. <coughs> As a result of this notion that there is an appropriate style for an appropriate setting, we find Adam is one of the first British architects enthusiastically to embrace the idea of building castles. He made designs for over 40 castles, and the most famous of these, of course, is Culane Castle, which you see on the screen at the moment. Thinking of Adam as an entrepreneur, he was asked, by David Kennedy just to regularize and make an L-shaped tower house useful. The very first proposal that he did was to fill in the square there. But he is a master of project cultivation. And as you can see, he laid two wings down the side here, which are the wings here and here, then built on a kitchen block there and incorporated a long row of old stable buildings with a little uh, laundry building as a square at the end. The date is 1777. And an important feature in the castle is the way in which Adam is breaking the facade, making these additions on either side, but masking the addition with round turrets uh, which run up each corner and add greatly to the picturesque of the composition, to use his own phrase, in the way they make advances and recesses. Now, project cultivation. <clears throat> this is how he finished up. Eileen Harris commented on how he demolished staircases at Sion, but somehow never managed to get the Duke to build them again. Uh, but I just should have pointed this out to you. No, wrong one. <clears throat> Here, he built a new staircase there and a back staircase here in 1777. Uh, in 1785, which is just a matter of 12 years later, he got David Kennedy to demolish his new staircases and build a completely different arrangement, the back staircase here and the very famous central oval staircase of Calais, and add on a whole new suite of rooms across the front of the building ending, of course, in this dramatic round tower with the great mass of solid wall head across the top. Now, John Fleming was the first person to suggest that what Adam is getting at here is the notion of some ancient Roman fortification, that we are not in Scotland, but in Caledonia when we get to uh, Culane Castle. And I think there is, is much to be said for that view. Adam... It's not a static artist. And the late works show, I think, a remarkable development. You would have thought it was enough to invent a castle style and then build castles. In 1777, uh, the exact year in which he did Culane, he began working at the Oaks for the Earl of Derby. There's a whole series of designs in the Soane Museum, which you see here, a first quick sketch of how the oaks might appear, with little notes about the design. This is how it actually finished up. It wasn't ever to be completed because, unfortunately, the countess ran off with an old rue before, I can't ever, that's right, uh, <coughs> before the building was, was finished. And very sadly, all that we got was one wing here and one third of the main front built. Uh, across there, and an octagonal tower here, which you can just see. This view is taken from the lithographic uh, view, which was published in the middle of the 19th century, with the sale particulars of the Oaks when it came up for sale. And of course, it was demolished in the uh, late 1950s, so we've lost it completely. But it's a very grand and very handsome example of Adam's mature, round-towered castle style, closely linked to Culane as is Dalhuaran Castle, which Ian Gow rightly prophesied that I would show you, a massive round tower on the front <coughs> overlooking Girvan Water, and then a broken facade, these are later 19th century additions, corner square towers flat, and then a round tower rippling across the front of the design. This is real, serious architecture. Uh, the wall heads are largely solid. It's none of the sort of frilly fussiness of uh, Horace Walpole's Gothic 
uh, building. And it reaches its climax, of course, in the magnificent structure of uh, Seton Castle in East Lothian, a house which Adam designed in 1789, visited in 1791, and had dinner with the owner when it had been completed on his last visit back to Scotland. Now, uh, this is a building in which the sort of Van Bruggian uh, undertow of Robert Adams' inspiration really seems to be quite clear. It has connotations of Seton Delaval, and of course he worked for Lord Delaval in the massing of the house itself, which his clerk referred to as the keep, rather interestingly. And then you create a forecourt with these uh, U-shaped buildings back to back, and a wall in front with an archway uh, opening through into the forecourt of the building itself. It seems to me that this is the real sort of peak of the round towered castle style uh, as Adam produced it. Um, there is the entrance front within the courtyard and the back of the building. Quite without precedent in British or European architecture, in the way in which it's handled, in the extraordinary sculpturesque treatment of the stone and the alternation of round-headed and square-headed windows. And it is a building of the most extraordinary power and conviction, and a building which is synthetic. It is in no sense a replica of something else, nor is it a derivative revival. The only thing that is derivative about it is perhaps this tripartite window with the big segmental fan light up above it, which Adam developed from his survey of the Porta Aurea at Diocletian's palace at Split. But it, it is not a building which depends on the work of other people. And I think this is important because Adam is ill, he's in his 60s, he's a person who had been the darling of fashionable society 25 years ago, and he is still finding within his own personality the resources to develop a powerful and an original style. But there is not just the round-towered castle style with these turrets masking the changes. There is as well an extraordinary sharp faceted castle style, of which I think the best example is Castle Upton uh, for Lord Templeton in County Antrim. And I show you here two views of the double courtyard stable block, which Adam designed. Uh, irregular octagonal corners, the entrance uh, set out in square block towers, and think for a moment of the entrance of the garden front at Kevelston, which derives from uh, Roman triumphal arches salient columns, salient entablatures. Here is perhaps that motif distilled and brought into something completely different in Adam's castle style. The date, once again, is um, 1788, so within four years of his death. <coughs> and then right at the end of his life, for a Mr. Stevenson, he designed this extraordinarily dinky uh, little castle, smooth, uh, walls, label mouldings, up and down battlements, little piece of decoration, one might almost say a la Piranesi in the way in which it's been laid on. The octagonal turret coming forward. This was going to be built on the banks of the Clyde. It never came into being, but the date is now 1790. And I thought you might like to see the sort of faceted architecture that you get in this rather uh, slim stonework style. This is the uh, manse, uh, or the rectory, attached to the Episcopalian Church of St. George in um, Queen Street, in, or York Place, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, which was built by James after Robert's death and gives us a sort of quite different character to the bold massing of the rounded castle style. Now, it was fascinating to consider Chambers' views of uh, Piranesi's plans and to consider Robert Adams' interest in geometry because this seems to me to be an absolutely vital element in his creative processes. And within the castle style, I'm just showing you here uh, a Renaissance Belvedere. It's almost worthy of uh, Leonardo da Vinci and uh, Santa Maria della Consolazione of Todi, the way in which it is a completely pure centralized plan, a square with round chapels in the corner and a big round section in the middle. But the, the visual language is the language of Adam's unique castle style. And here is a building which we only have a very, very quick 
planned sketch, but you can see how it masses up to a, a quite extraordinary structure. And one thinks of Montano's three volumes of Roman sepulchral chambers, which uh, Adam had in his collection. He bought the original drawings when he was on the grand tour in Rome, where you get exactly this cluster of uh, symmetrical planning about two axes. And <coughs> fascination with symmetrical and fancy planning is very much a feature which stays in his work right to the end of his career. This is the castle which he designed for uh, Lord Lovett, the son of Lord Lovett, who was executed here in London after the Jacobite Rebellion. Uh, his, his states were returned to him, and in 1779, Adam produced designs for Bewley Castle, which posit a most fascinating plan in which you get a, a V-shaped building with an octagonal entrance hall taking you through an oval lobby into a circular saloon. Nothing surprising in that, but what is surprising is the forecourt with the dart-shaped plan and the wings coming off on either side. And when you move out of this circular room, you might legitimately expect a flat facade, and in fact you find your facade is moving off at an angle. So the, the building the, in its plan and layout is, is full of surprises and ingenuity. And of course the grandest of all these 45 degree access designs is the proposals he made for Lord Rosebery at Barnbogel Castle here, in which you see a, a very extraordinary synthesis of the castle style in formal terms, depending on rounded towers and rounded features along the entrance front and being developed on the side to the first and fourth as this extraordinarily severe uh, rectangular structure set diagonally as a point um, onto the level of the water. Earthry Castle, which was the very last castle begun in Robert Adam's lifetime, now the centre of Stirling University, is another house which demonstrates his interest in uh, fancy plans. Fancy plans, if you like, which go right back to his experience in Rome. Uh, circular entrance hall screened by columns coming through the staircase space into a rectangular room with a shallow segmental apse in one side with the three windows in it and that is the section of the house here. And then as we saw in the B-plan or dark shaped castle for Lord Lovett, the rooms opening out on either side are sort of bent back like wings curving back uh, on either side this door takes you into an irregularly placed apsidal eating room and then through once again um, into the dining room. The sophistication of these plans is absolutely fascinating and they are not exclusive to the castle style. Um, this is the house which uh, he designed for Hutchison Muir at Great Saxon in Essex. It uh, seems to have been begun and interestingly, bearing in mind Giles's uh, lecture here, is a very clear example of colour coding. This is a, a drawing, a working drawing. Everything is sized out. The walls are in pink and the timber work is marked in in yellow. And this was for Hutchison Muir's house, in which we have got another of these elaborately developed plans, and a plan which in a sense has surprise built into it because the entrance front is one of those standard mid-18th century five-unit facades. A portico in the middle, three bay links, and then terminal pavilions. And yet when you get round the back of the house, total surprise. New revolutionary architecture with loggias alternating with projecting bays, loggia, projecting pedimented bay, loggia again. So that the plan is in fact a great segmental building set behind a straight facade. And the key linkage point is, of course, provided by an oval staircase, which anticipates what uh, we have already seen he built uh, at Culane Castle. Now, Hutchison Muir's Great Saxon um, dates from the late um, 1770s and noticeably was begun but not finished because of the recession, which was limiting Adam's opportunity. In terms of classical architecture, I think his great late work must be the monumental grandeur of Edinburgh University, the old college, as it is now called, on the South Bridge. Here is Roman architecture. Monolithic columns across the front, 18 feet high, four of them raised up and framing a gigantic triumphal archway. 
<coughs> into the town's great college. And I would like to draw to your attention the treatment of the side, a very, very shaven, slim architecture. Almost like that rather nasty architecture of the 1910s, which we sometimes see, where Beaux-Arts classicism has all the profile cut off its mouldings. But Adam here is developing a, a, an alternating variation between elaborate rustication, absolutely smooth ashlar rustication with a huge Diocletian window in the base here, so that you get that sort of sense of sheer surface contrasting with the very grandeur of the entrance facade. Now, what about the late classical buildings which match the late castles? These are relatively unknown and relatively few that came to fruition. But I thought I'd put you up he here or show you Curdale. It's spelt Kirkdale, but it's pronounced like what happens to milk in the sun, curdle. Um, and it's in the stewardry of Kukubri. And it was built for Adam's great hope. 1787, uh, five years before his death, Sir Samuel Hannay, a nabob of vast fortune, great speculative interests, MP. Adam designed a house for him at Putney. And this uh, large villa with flanking wings for his estate uh, in the southwest of Scotland. And like all great nabobs in that period, Hannay went bust. I mean, think of what's happened to Alan Bond, sent off to prison. Uh, and Hannay sailed far too close to the wind, uh, and really there had to be a parliamentary inquiry into his procedures. But Adam had thought that here was his Nathaniel Curzon of the second generation, somebody that he could work with. And he was going to design, as you can see here, this is a drawing in the um, Mallard Collection in Yale, a magnificent courtyard of stables with another of these round tired entrances and a huge circular riding school attached to it. And what I'd like you to notice is the, the contrast or well, the two uh, proposals existing side by side for the elegant, sheer, classical villa overlooking the Solway Firth, and then tucked down in the valley, and um, this more dramatic castle-style stable group. Now, this is not the Adam that most people know about. Sheer, smooth surfaces, projecting, plain, overhanging eaves. This is the sort of architecture that we associate with James Playfair, and perhaps even to a certain extent in its Italianisms, uh, to the architecture of uh, John Nash. But it is designed by Adam in 1787. And there are a great many very understated designs in this period, which are beautifully planned. We mentioned his banker, Robert Drummond. Robert Drummond uh, asked Adam to produce two designs for him for his estate in Hampshire at Cadland. In the end, he built a house to designs of Holland. But what you see here is the miniature villa which Adam proposed. And this is stripped down minimalist architecture. A uh, small tripartite doorway with a big, deep fan above it, and otherwise cubic massing with, please note, the roof running up to a single chimney in the center. And the plan works absolutely beautifully for a small villa. Uh, entrance hall taking you into an apse, and I was talking about uh, the Lord Chief Baron Ord's house in Queen Street, very much the same sort of arrangement here. Dummy door matching a door going through here into the uh, eating parlor, going straight through here into the drawing room, a library ingeniously contrived here, and then through a columnar screen into the staircase. And all this is fitted beautifully within the confines of absolutely sheer and plain rectangular space. There is another aspect of Adam's late classical buildings, which you see on the screen at the moment, and I think this is probably continental in origin. It is a disinclination to go for a strong central focus. This is Belleville House near Inverness, which he designed for James McPherson, the translator and inventor of Ossian. And you will see here how something which almost might be described as proto-Nash appears in the uh, low 
rectangular coolie hat roofs move now right out to the ends of the facade and the centre is understated. It is the ends which are given prominence and in this little design up here, which Dallas has already shown us, you see the villa for Captain Pitts uh, in which you have got paired pylons moved sideways and given, uh, which give the sort of main emphasis and then between them is placed the portico of the house. This is something I meant to point out to you when we were looking at Curdle because it is arranged in exactly the same way. Sunnyside was built, this is near Edinburgh, uh, the rear elevation, absolute minimalist architecture just depending on a few well-defined horizontal tap bands and string courses here, and then the entrance front, uh, paired elevation of single bays with pediments and uh, Venetian windows underneath, and an absolutely beautiful little plan for a small villa, a square hall taking you through into a cruciform drawing room and then direct connection established here into the dining room of the house with a double upside arrangement the fireplace facing one of the Venetian windows. The staircase is accommodated behind this window in here and then the uh, study uh, for the owner of the house placed here. And just where you need it, the, the lavatory. Uh, it's always embarrassing when you're sort of visiting a house that you have to say to people, where's the loo? And Adam, in these small villas, always designs it very carefully off the main circulation space so that it will, in fact, be convenient and fairly obvious. And there it is there, and it even gets a nice little tiny window of so you see the lights in at the side of the portico. Now, Robin said he didn't think Adam was any good as a planner, but no, I think... No. Sorry, you said Pyramid. something... Oh, Piranesi, sorry. <laughs> you did say Adam, yeah, no, no, didn't, didn't you? Else would, uh, I never, never would dream of saying All right, well, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we'll get on to that later. But uh, I, I do think Sunnyside is a, a beautifully designed, small classical house, minimalist in its architectural treatment, and yet given a facade which obviously has strength. The same sort of analysis can go with this great loss, which is uh, Walkinshaw, built for Day Hort MacDowell. Adam laid the foundation stone of this house uh, on his last visit to Scotland in 1791, and it's his only built contribution to the genre of the triangular house. But very interestingly, he doesn't make it an equilateral triangle, he makes it an isosceles triangle, and so the top angle is a 90 degree angle and it allows him to develop two fronts with an absolutely logical sequence without any of those awkward lines that come when you have a 60 degree angle which is the case of an equilateral triangle. So it's slightly wider across this front than it is across the other two sides. If you look at the elevations that result, you will see by the decision to carry the tower features higher, we're getting that movement away from the focus onto the centre into the focus on the ends. And this plan, for a triangular plan, works absolutely beautifully. All architects know that it's a good idea to cut out as far as you can useless circulation space. And look at what Adam has contrived an entrance into a D-shaped hall which doubles as a staircase and rises through two storeys, as you see in the cross section here. Off to one side, a little service stair uh, opening off a corridor. And that is really the only circulation space, a square lobby, and then you connect through with this suite of octagonal, double apse rectangular, octagonal, double apse rectangular, rooms, so that the whole sequence flows absolutely logically and clearly. Uh, <clears throat> this is obviously entrance, this is the dining room, this is a study, this is an anteroom, this is a drawing room, this is a bedroom with the dressing room attached to it, and once again, a loo, just where you want it, directly off the hall. And on the upper floor, the planning works perfectly as well. Each bedroom has a logical and rationally planned uh, dressing room opening directly off it. I, I cannot commend to you too highly the quality of this design for Dehart MacDowell. 
Another pattern is the dome over a square. Pure geometry proposed for Fenton Cawthorn, an MP who was uh, banished from the house for embezzlement and built, as you see on the far screen here, in the little mausoleum at Westerkirk in Dumfries. Uh, a good example of the clarity of geometrical thinking in Adam's last works. And the final building which I want to show you, which some of you have no doubt heard me speaking of before, is the house for Mr. Wilson. Now, this is really quite interesting because it shows a quick doodle by Adam in one of the sketches volumes in the Soane Museum. This is the beginning of a design. Mr. Wilson was a bachelor who had to get out of the country late in life and died immensely rich in Pisa, so we probably have a good idea what he was like. Uh, up at the top there is the first idea for the plan, and here is Adam's sketch. And I think it's rather nice because it's an asymmetrical, picturesque view that he takes. A three-story rotunda with a drum and a dome uh, projecting through the top of it, and then linked to it on one side only, uh, a single separate bay with a fan-like section above a window. You can see here what he's thinking about. A little hall, circular room, and he might fit accommodation round it on either side. And the design which he ends up with is really one of the most perfect little trianon of the 18th century. A rectangular entrance hall with a staircase immediately beside it. Underneath the rising flight of the stairs that goes to the upper story is an arch which takes you through once again to a conveniently placed lavatory. Here is the owner, Mr. Wilson's bedroom in an octagon with a tiny little dressing room also through which you can go through a window out onto the terrace. The circle is his saloon, and the oval is his dining room. Now, in terms of fancy planning, within the confines of a facade which is 38 feet wide, to get an oval, a circle, a rectangle, and an octagon, all fitting together nicely, and also have this notion of a, a Kentian or a classical rotunda, seems to me to be quite extraordinary uh, manipulation. And there's what the building would have looked like. Uh, the garden front, uh, one side, the entrance front, uh, a feature which we've seen in Eileen Harris's lecture uh, occurring in the dining room at Siam, the long line coming across the two columns with the arch going up above it. There is tremendous consistency in Robert Adams architecture right through his life. But I think there is as well tremendous variety, and as I hope, as I've shown you in this rather uh, helter-skelter survey, both in his drawings as a romantic artist, in his castle-style buildings, and in the late villas, there is freshness and life. Thank you. Well, what can I say at the end of the day? <laughs> Not very much. So much has already been said. Um, <clears throat> what I think Alistair has demonstrated unequivocally is the uh, immense self-confidence of Adam. Um, and it is a confidence that he carries along with him all his life uh, with genius. Adam really was a genius. I mean, he was a far... Chambers, for example, was not a genius, but he was a better architect, I think. Adam had immense fertility of invention, and this really does come out in uh, these, um, these late inventions, these late uh, picturesque designs. I sometimes say to myself, do we really like all of them? Uh, do we really like Dalquara? I'm not sure that we do. I think we prefer it as a ruin, perhaps. Um, 
I would have liked to have heard more about uh, the, really the detailed sources, and it couldn't have been done in a lecture in 40 minutes, the detailed sources for these extraordinary plan inventions. Do they have any precedent uh, in other designs? It struck me, just looking at some of Alastair's slides, that there is a very strong, uh, 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 um, influence of Sir John Vanbrugh, and especially Vanbrugh's utilitarian architecture, especially Vanbrugh's um, uh, uh, ordnance buildings, or buildings in that ordnance style. I was thinking particularly of that lost building by Vanbrugh at Ashley Park, uh, at Wharton-on-Thames. Um, but nevertheless, whatever Adam looks at in the creation of these designs, whether he looks intently at some of Roger Morris's ordnance work, um, and again, one detects a little uh, uh, resemblances here between some of Morris's designs and um, Adam's. Nevertheless, um, one is rather lost to uh, 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 motive monger when it comes to these extraordinary uh, um, plan uh, combinations, which really do achieve the sort of new revolutionary um, architecture of compositions that have had no precedent since perhaps um, Piedmontese architecture of the period of, um, uh, of, of Uvar. I would have, I asked myself questions apropos uh, the uh, long period of producing his uh, picturesque compositions as an artist, and, and, and as Alastair quite rightly says, uh, uh, Adam is unique in this. Um, I did wonder whether he had seen many of William Gilpin's uh, watercolours. Um, they were not published until much later. But we know, we have documentary evidence, that um, rather like Salomon de Bros, um, uh, uh, Gilpin was always seeking uh, uh, approbation and was sending his uh, picturesque watercolours following his tours around to every, everybody. And I think there is possibly a, a link here between um, uh, uh, Gilpin and, and, and Adam. Finally, my, my, my last observation was about that, Bella, is it Belleville? Yes. The, the House of Belleville. Now, wasn't that book published in Leipzig? Yes. I think it was, Steiglitz. Yes. And if you saw that building in Leipzig, you would not question that it uh, wasn't produced by an architect in Leipzig. It was just something that struck me. Um, I, I, I've really enjoyed Alastair's lecture, and we look forward very much to his book. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody was hell-bent on having a castle, and obviously these castles are not exclusive to mountainous landscape. They can play the lineage card. I am of very ancient noble blood, and it's appropriate that I should have a castle. Um, I think Adam, like all people trying to sell their ideas, was quite prepared to use whatever argument was appropriate at any time you're aware of the body of literature that exists about castles in mountainous landscapes, but 
it, it is it is certainly the, the hard one out, and it's very very complicated because it's developed out of the earlier villa that Taylor seems to have worked out as well. Was just as a brief question, was the design for Lord Rosebery uh, serious or an ideal? I mean, did Adam and Lord Rosebery really believe they would get that castle built? Did he most developed yes. both in scale and geometric quality and everything else, almost as if it was too ideal to be true? I don't honestly think so. Lord Rosebery was courting an heiress at the time that the design was made, uh, and he may have been wishing to add to the allure of his personal charms that of a marvelous design by Adam. But the footman was going to have a 16-foot diameter octagonal bedroom with yes. four apses in it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of over-provision. <laughs> As I mentioned Taylor, and I must say, looking at some of those designs he was going through, look at Seton, um, it's remarkably Taylorian planning combination. I just wonder how much Adam is taking on Taylor and expanding the Taylorian idea with lots of county bays, complex um, room shapes, um, really taking Taylor ideas. Well, to you to refer to Taylor yourself, Charles, and saying what a pity all these drawings have gone missing. And uh, it, it is one of the great problems that Taylor and, and Robert Adam link and what there was. Uh, Taylor was very much a businessman's architect, got on well with wealthy people in the city. And that was <coughs> really inimical to Robert Adam's personality as well. It's always seemed to me that there are lots of, of links, that it's, there's nothing that one can prove really or demonstrate that I'm aware of. You did mention the link to Montana, which I think uh, is immensely important. Uh, Montana, by his publication, like the many other publications, probably has got slightly uh, devalued because the buildings were identified falsely by the editors. Uh, I wonder whether um, Adam would have known that. Uh, Montana was drawing from drawings by Peluzzi and he would have valued them so highly as long as he did because most of those villa plans are in fact reworkings of Montana's plans <coughs> with much more refined sections than Montana could ever achieve. Yes, well, I think the Montana element is very important because you see, uh, we know from the catalogue of Blair Adam that. Uh, there was at Blair Adam uh, a set of published Montanos, and it is there rather significant that when Robert Adam is on his grand tour, he buys the manuscripts, which are in his own museum. Now, unfortunately, the manuscript catalogue of Blair Adam, the last dated book to be entered in it, I think, was 1781. So the catalogue that we have, we're not mm -hmm. sure which of the books were acquired by William Adam and which of them were bought later by Robert or James or, or John. Um, but my feeling is that the Montana makes much more sense as something which William Adam would have acquired and therefore this vision which I have about William Adam's library is that the young Adam boys when they were at Blair Adam on a wet day were lying on their tummies on the floor of their father's library flicking through all these wonderful books and Perhaps the enthusiasm for antiquity starts in the sort of wet day when Robert Adam was in his adolescence. I mean, we all know that's the way life is, don't we? Uh, so, but uh, but I, I do absolutely agree with you. I don't think you buy the manuscript of a book that you already possess unless it's something that exercised a particular fascination for you. Yes, I mean, some of those elements are really direct quotes from the Trevor plan. Are they? I, yes, they I, are. I haven't picked that up. They yes, and also, um, I think he's quoting... You, you mean the triangular villa, Walkinshaw? The triangular villas, yes, which I suspect that what Montana was thinking of was the, um, the drawing of the Tempsco Inconsiderato by Domenico da Valignano, which he uh, makes, a, makes just publishes a section of. Yes. 
Um, and I think those are very interesting to add. Well, I, I think they are. I, I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say they're direct quotes because I, I think they're they are developments, are they not? Hmm? Yes, they are developments. Hmm. Yeah. Because he, I think he also tries to refine the sections. Yeah. Because Paul Montaigne is not very good on the sections. No, he isn't. <laughs> um, although the drawings are much more accurate than the engravers yeah. because they were modified. Yeah. Um, so, once he had the drawings, he must have poured over them yes. very intensely. Alistair, you said that Adam made better <coughs> landscapes for his sisters for yeah. their future financial yeah. benefit, yeah. which implies that they had some commercial value. He hoped they would have some commercial value. Well, did he? No, they didn't. They that didn't. was the sadness from the sisters. When the, when the niece, who was absolutely stuck, tried to sell them. They, they tried to sell them through a Christie's, I think, some of them. And Christie's had a look at them and said they weren't to sell. You see, artists did make drawings for sale. Oh, yeah. 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 I think mean, maybe Adam was in this terrible. Oh, I think, yeah, I, think, I think Adam hoped that they would. I mean, I think there's something almost poignant about it because he did die of a gastric ulcer. And he got the gastric ulcer through the awful business of running William Adam Company with his brothers through two sessions, really. Um, and to have the burden of anxiety about his unmarried sisters. And after dinner in the evening, you go off upstairs and knock off another romantic drawing. I think that's, a, that's a, another 12 guineas for them. I think it's always a good And this is, I think, very Scottish. I mean, remember what was going on? <laughs> Remember Walter Scott writing and writing and writing to pay off the creditors and constables. His whole life of Napoleon embarked on to be a money spiller to pay off the debt. And I, I do see Adam, and this is where I wouldn't quite agree with, with Adam Tate, I see him as almost relentlessly producing those drawings. And I showed you nice ones, but I mean, <laughs> they, they have a sort of monotony. If you, if you get 200 of the sort of Adam picturesque drawings together. That they, there's a lot of staffage in them. And, and I, I, I feel this the burden of the man who thinks he's responsible for his sisters. But it's quite definite. I mean, Peggy in her memoir, often her memoir, talks about Mr. Adam's drawings and how beautiful they were and how he applies them. And how he intended them to be a patrimony for his sisters. So that, you know, they obviously sat talking to each other in the house in London. Evening, so I think it's true. It's fascinating, isn't it, how there's a sort of tension in Adam between the picturesque and the very strong classical symmetry. I and mean, it's picked up in the long gallery at Zion, where you get this wonderful balance right down with the central door and then the end doors and the fireplace. And then you get your directive to the picturesque rhythm, as it were, at one end. In the same way, with Killeen, you have an extremely symmetrical building, but you have the introduction of this angular vista yes. across the bridge. Yes. But he never really allows himself to design a building irregularly, obviously, as you pointed out. Well, it's the approach very often that it's he tries. The, it's the approach and it's the extra bits, mm -hmm. because the, the kitchen at Killeen sort of sticks out like a thumb from the side of the building, and mm -hmm. the, the service yes. lot that he built at Oxenford yes. was, was exactly the same. And I think it's quite interesting that little William Wilson's house, the last one I showed, that he, he chose to draw it in his first what will this look like as a lopsided building. Surely above all at Culane, by pushing out of that new saloon, so to speak, in the seventies, it's impossible to, to photograph if anyone who doesn't know what it's like, but the view that it takes in is sheer romanticism. I mean, across to Aaron, to Goatfell, down to Ailes Cray, mm. the drama of the sea there. I mean, that's, that that the wall is romantic, or the sighting of Seaton. I know the coal mine port below it, but... Uh, yes, no, Seaton's a good sighting as well, isn't mm. it? The starchy thing about Canadian is it's a bachelor's house, once again. Do you think it should be a pattern there? Hmm? There seems to be a pattern. <laughs> 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 Two bachelors don't make a clear tell.
Right, well, thank you very much. Now we're coming to our summing up now. <coughs> and um, we need to introduce to you, I don't think we need to introduce to you, but we are going to introduce to you Robin Middleton, who is at Columbia University nowadays. And he's going to give us a little summing up or, or, or something. Right? We wouldn't like to predict precisely what it's going to be, but we will anticipate. Rob. Well, I really have nothing very much to say at all. Um, but I must confess to a certain degree of amazement at hearing that William Chambers was a better architect than Adam. Um, I think this is one of the problems because, in a sense, we haven't, despite years and years and years, almost from Adam's own lifetime, he has stimulated interest. Um, sometimes it's been adverse criticism, one thing and another. But people have always felt impelled in one way that, to react to Adam. Um, he has been a name, a constant name, in um, the consciousness of architecture in England. There is some magic there. There is something that requires a response. There's also a vast degree of um, amount of information relating to him. Thousands and thousands of drawings, hundreds and hundreds of letters, and there is a corresponding literature, vast literature about Adam. And yet, I think the sort of, the real qualities of Adam sort of seem to elude, elude us all the time. Um, the, the critical um, apparatus begins with Horace Walpole, who chided him for being a mere decorator in one way and another. And I think it is in the disparaging sense of decorator that Adam has very largely been um, understood and appreciated, as far as he has been appreciated. And in fact, the real qualities of Adam's architecture are curiously not properly investigated, despite this um, historical um, impetus to look at his work and um, a consciousness of what he was up to one, one way and another. I mean, even information, in a way, has not been properly tabulated until recently. One didn't even have a proper, reliable catalogue of his work. And we have that now, so in a sense one can almost begin. And as Eileen Harris has shown today, that even in obvious examples of his work, you have to start from scratch. Uh, even the sort of precision of information is, is needed again. Each of his projects will have to be looked at, to be analyzed, and the, the detailed making of it um, will have to be um, grounded on, on, on more and more and more documentation. This is sort of perhaps a sort of boring positivistic approach, but I think it's actually clearly essential. There are, despite this vast literature, there are very, very few books one can read on Adam with any sense of illumination. Quite obviously, um, John Fleming has done much um, in that realm. But even then, if you go back to John Fleming, you'll find the, there's a certain slippage of dates and information in one way and another. This is not in any way to disparage John Fleming's work. I think it's absolutely vital. And you can see, in a sense, how Alistair Rohn today spurred by, in a sense, um, Fleming's investigations of um, Adam's late picturesque work, has tried again and again over the years, in Country Life articles, one thing and another, to make us conscious of whole areas of Adam's operation which have almost been excluded from the, 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 the standard works in one way and another. And it's only now, I think, um, that one is even beginning to get close to Adam. But the whole underpinning of the social um, connection seems not to have made any inroads into architectural history, and it's obviously vital from just to do one or two remarks about the client's patronage and one thing or another we get here, but nothing to do with the whole um, background of life, um, the way these buildings were used in one way or another, and I must actually make very, very clear here that um, I think as, in terms of planning, I think Adam is one of the most extraordinary, wonderful planners um, in, in all history of architecture. <laughs> but um, far, far from thinking he's a bad planner. And in fact, it's that aspect of, of, of Adam, I think, which is really a, one of the more vital aspects of his operation, both uh, in the internal operation of the way the 
rooms relate to one another, not simply in the geometry of the plan, but in three dimensions. And that is something I think we almost don't have a critical vocabulary to begin to approach. And it's not only internally, I mean, things that haven't been mentioned here today, but could re very rarely, but readily have been brought up, I mean, in, in terms of urban um, adventure, the sort of great schemes of Adam alongside King's College um, Chapel and things like that, these extraordinary things, the designs for Chancery Lane or the, um, the enormous runs of building, parallel runs of building in Edinburgh. Is it the North Bridge or the South Bridge? I've forgotten which. North Bridge, South Bridge. But I mean, wonderful, extraordinary schemes like that are, are not even adduced in standard textbooks. And they certainly should be because there's a, there's, a, there's a great passion in Adam's design in one way and another. And it's not just, of course, in terms of Adam that the problem arises. Um, it is a whole approach to architecture in itself. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very, very lousy um, apparatus available to people to understand and explain architecture. Um, contemporary architectural journals, if you look at most of them, and particularly, I must say, American ones, and particularly the more pretentiously intellectual ones, have a totally repellent jargon in which they try to explain what is happening in formal terms and concepts of architecture. And uh, they don't readily help us. But as historians, I think, one can actually at least try to isolate um, these buildings, try to evaluate them if they have gone in terms of the drawings, in terms of things, and imagine them to sort of project them in the mind's eye in one way or another, and um, understand the felicities of that architecture. And I think we need to do more and more and more of that. And I think far too little has been done, far too little. I think we have to do, develop a whole theoretical understanding and conceptual understanding of what this architecture is about. And then I think Adam will emerge as even, even more magical and wondrous than we think him already. <laughs> And thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Well, um, all I'm going to say is that we clearly we come to the end of our day. Uh, and I, uh, if you don't mind, I'd just like to, to, to say to you all how grateful we are that you've come. And I'd also like to thank First of all, John Wilk Lee, who sort of initiated this idea with us about 18 months ago, and being followed by an enormous amount of, of, of work that was put in by Margaret Richardson, who, who had really sort of done a vast amount of the organizational work for this, this, this very, very enjoyable day. So I thank, thank Margaret, Margaret very much. And uh, I'd also like to to, to, to thank uh, our, our, our principal, Alan Balfour, who, who instantly last summer said, right, he's out, make sure and we'll, we'll support the Adam Conference, you know, come what may. So we really want to thank you very much for, for letting us sort of go ahead, come what may. And, uh, and last of all, you know, I'm delighted that you all have come. Hope it's been a worthwhile day for you all. Thank you very much indeed.